Hi there and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith and in this video we're going to learn the one to four player game Tiny Epic Mechs designed by Scott Alms and published by Gameland Games who helps sponsor this video. In the future virtual reality has been replaced by actual reality. No longer on video screens now highly trained athletic mech pilots enter an arena for sport and entertainment wielding weapons, mechanized armor and if they're lucky the mighty mech suit. The crowds are keen for an epic battle, so join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, give each player one of these cards and a figure in their chosen color. These are known as item meeples and represent the player's mech pilot in the game. We'll be setting up a game for two players in this video, so we'll return these components back to the box. Each person should also collect the health, energy, credit, score, turret, mine tokens, and power armor in their color, along with matching ad hoc and eight program cards. Now shuffle and randomly deal two of these pilots to each person. The pilots are all the same except for their special abilities, so check these over, and then players will pick which one of the pilots they wish to keep, putting it with the side labeled pilot face up in front of themselves, and returning the others to the box. Your pilot has a health track here, and you'll place your health token on the highest valued space. This here is your resource track, and you'll put your energy and credit token onto the three space. Zone cards like these come in three different types. One for the mighty mech suit, which you place in the center of the play area, putting the mech suit itself on top of it. There's also one base zone for each player color, which you can set aside for now, and then all of the rest, which you'll shuffle and arrange randomly around the mighty mech zone based on the image found in the rule book for your player count, which you can also see on screen. Squares labeled B, you'll leave blank for now, but for a two player game, it will look something like this when you're done. Now pick a starting player randomly and give them this starting player token. Beginning with a person to their right and going counterclockwise, each person chooses an empty space labeled B to put their colored base into along with their mech pilot. You'll also flip your mine tokens face down, keeping their values a secret from the other players, though you can always look at your own. And then you privately pick one mine to place face down on your own base. We'll see how mines work and why you might want to pick a certain one a little bit later. Nearby, put the round score and mighty mech card, placing this round token on the one space of the round track and setting the player's scoring tokens blank side up beside the scoring card. These are the weapon cards and they come in two different types, labeled basic here at the top or advanced. Give each player one copy of each of the four types of basic weapons, removing any extras from the game. Secretly, each person picks one of the basic weapons and then reveals it when everyone is ready, putting it into either one of the two slots on their pilot. Nearby, all of the unchosen basic weapons are then collected and placed face up in piles of matching cards. And the advanced weapons are shuffled into a face down deck with its top four cards dealt face up in a row. You then create a supply of all the game's weapon pieces and collect the one matching the basic weapon that you chose for your pilot. You then attach it to either of your figure's hand slots. And that's the setup. In Tiny Epic Mechs, you'll be planning actions for your pilot to take as you collect resources to power up your character with new weapons and mech suits, as well as trying to claim areas of the arena for scoring while at the same time facing your opponents in combat, all of which can score you victory points. Have the most points by the end, and you win. The game is played over a series of six rounds, and each round is broken into three phases, starting with the program phase. Here, players simultaneously pick four of their program cards as the actions they will take that round, placing them in the order they wish to perform them from left to right on their side of the arena. The orientation of the cards matter, as the arrows on them will dictate the direction that your pilot moves, as we'll see in a moment. Also, your four chosen cards must remain a secret from your opponents, so as you place them on the table, place one of the cards you aren't using face down on top of each one. I will usually plan my program under the table like this, and then once I have my four choices, I put the other four cards on top of each one and then bring it back above the table, placing them out in their row. And this way, I don't accidentally flash the cards that I've chosen to the other players. 
Now you move on to the second phase, execution. And here, the first player will reveal and execute the first card in their row. Then the next player in clockwise order goes and reveals and executes their first card, and so on until you get back to the first player, who then reveals and resolves the second card in their program order, and again the next player does the same thing. And around and around you go like this until all the players have revealed and resolved all of their programmed cards. So with that understood, let's go back to the table and I'll show you how each of these different types of program actions work. First of all, every card is made up of two possible elements. A move, which is represented by its arrow, and an action, which is its text. You must always complete the movement portion, and this occurs first. If you see a single arrow, like we have here, then you move one space in that direction relative to your position at the table facing the arena. For example, an arrow like this would move my pilot here, while an arrow like this in front of my opponent who is seated on the other side of the table would move their pilot to this position. Now let's say I had been here, but my arrow was facing in this direction. If following the movement of the arrow would cause you to exit the arena, you instead bump up against the wall and just stay in place. In either situation, after moving, you may then choose to perform the card's action, if possible, which will be listed on its edge. Unless, when you moved, it caused you to enter a zone with an enemy pilot. In that case, the card's action is cancelled, and you enter into combat instead, which we'll discuss later. Going back to our original example though, resolving this card would move me here, and then I could choose to use the collect action. During the game, mines and turrets will be added to the arena, and entering spaces with your own causes you no damage. But, if you enter a zone with an enemy mine or turret, you take damage from them. For a mine, flip it over, and then add its value to the number in its zone. This is how much damage you take, so in this case, a total of 5. Anytime you take damage in the game, reduce your health by moving this token that number of spaces. Then, after taking damage from the mine, it is returned to its owner's supply, where they can use it again later. If you ever enter a space with a turret, you take damage equal to just the value of the zone, so 2 in this case. If your health is ever reduced to 0, you're knocked out. We'll talk more about that later, but if you're knocked out by a mine or a turret, the player who placed those pieces gets one victory point, and you do not get to perform your action for that turn. If, on the other hand, you took damage and survived, the opponent doesn't get the point and you still get to perform your action. By the way, when you gain points, show it by moving your marker along this track. And if you ever pass 40, flip your token to show that you've banked 40 points, and then continue counting from the start of the track again. One other quick thing, I said that if you enter a space with a mine, after taking its damage, you return it to the player who placed it. But in the case of a turret, if it knocks you out, it stays put. If instead you survive, it is returned to your opponent so they can use it again later. Before we talk about all the different types of actions found on the cards, I want to point out two that don't have specific actions. This is the first one and it's called the diagonal jump. This allows you to move one space diagonally in the direction of the arrow, and if this causes you to enter a space with an enemy pilot, combat begins as usual, but you get to perform a power attack as your first hit, which you're reminded of by this symbol. We'll talk more about combat later, but each weapon has a normal attack, which is the first line shown here, and a power attack, which is better. Next we have this double jump card, and let's say we started over here when this was being resolved. With this, you move two spaces in the direction of the arrow, skipping over the first space. This means you'll ignore any enemies, mines, or turrets there. You then resolve the space you land in, as normal, but again, as this symbol shows, if an enemy is there, you start combat with it, executing a power attack right away. With those two exceptions explained, now let's look at all the other programming cards which have specific actions that they give you after performing your move. This one says collect, and it means you gain resources from all of the zones you control, which are any that are occupied by your pilot, mines, and turrets. There are two different types of resources, energy, which is this symbol, and credits, which look like this. So you now get one of each listed resource in the zones you control. The number on the space itself doesn't matter, and neither does the number of your pieces within the same spot. For example, in a situation like this, I would get 1, 2, 
three energy, and one, two credits. Remember, I don't get a credit for each of my pieces here. When you gain or spend resources, adjust its related marker on this track, ensuring you never go above nine or below zero. This program lets you purchase a single weapon, and to do this, you'll look at all the face-up options here and buy any one of them. The cost to purchase your chosen weapon is shown on the right side of it here, and you reduce your related resources accordingly. Now, if you purchase one of these advanced weapons, replace it immediately with a card from the top of this deck. And if this deck ever runs out, you'll just be left with what's on the table. If you buy a basic weapon, you'll take it from its pile here, and nothing replaces it. But just note that you cannot buy a second copy of a basic weapon that you already own. Weapons you purchase go into a face-up area beside you, known as your stockpile, and you can have any number of weapons here. After buying a weapon, you should also pick up its matching plastic piece. Now, to equip a weapon, you place it from your stockpile into an appropriate slot on your pilot. Here, we can hold up to two basic weapons, but we'll see later how you can also get slots for advanced ones. In addition to equipping the cards, you also should attach the plastic piece to your pilot. As you gain more and more weapons, just note that you can swap and change the weapons you have equipped with your stockpile at any time except during combat. And no matter what kind of changes you make, you must always have at least one weapon equipped. Another program action is to deploy a mine, placing one from your supply into the zone you are currently in. And to do this, you pay credits equal to the value listed there, and then you secretly pick one of the mines from your supply to place face down. If all of your mines were already on the board, then you could pick any one of them to then move to this location. With the deploy a turret action, you pay energy equal to the zone's value, and then put one of your turrets there. Again, moving it from another location if all of your turrets are already deployed. At most, each zone can only have one mine or one turret, but not both. Otherwise, they can be added to any unoccupied zone, including your opponent's base. You can also place one in the same zone as the mighty mech suit, as long as you're inside the suit itself, and we'll learn how to do that a little bit later. If you're outside of the suit, like my pilot is here, then you cannot place a mine or turret in its space. The final type of action is called Power Up, and when you resolve this program, you can use it in one of two different ways. One option is to heal, and this means for each energy you pay, you can increase your health by two. Now, instead of healing, you can use the Power Up action to upgrade yourself. To do this, you must be in pilot form. To do this, you must be in pilot form, as shown here, with this side of your card face up. You then spend five credits and flip your pilot card over to its other power armor side, as noted here. You then place your health on the highest value, no matter what it had been previous to the flip. Also, as you can see, in addition to the two slots for basic weapons, you now have two slots for assigning advanced weapons. You also pop open your power armor, put your pilot inside, and then attach any basic weapons you have to its hands, and advanced weapons will attach to the top on its shoulders. Remember, you can always equip and swap weapons from your stockpile at any time, except during combat. Before we move on, one of the things I'd like to point out to you is that you'll find many reminders of the rules we've discussed here on these sheets. For example, to deploy a turret, it tells us that we need to spend energy. For a mine, it costs credits. If you knock out somebody with a turret or a mine, it gives you one point each. And when you're powering up, here's the two different options you can perform, either healing or upgrading into your power armor. And while the power armor gives you more health and lets you equip more weapons, it also has another very important feature. If you're in your power armor and at full health and enter the space with the mighty mech suit when it's empty, you may choose to immediately take control of it. And it's important to note you do not have to have played the power up program to do this. You just need to have moved into its space with your power armor at full health. You then take the Mighty Mech card, picking either side to use. They're exactly the same, except for the special power. So pick the side that has the power you want, and then place this over top of your pilot. This will replace your previous power with this new one, and then you put your health token on the 11 space. For entering the suit, as you're reminded of here, you also gain two points. Now this suit can only hold advanced weapons. So attach up to four of them as you like, and of course any basic weapons you'd have to remove. 
Now I had said earlier that you must always have at least one weapon on your pilot, but the Mighty Mech is the exception. You can enter it when you don't have any advanced weapons to attach to it. This means you won't have anything to attack with, but you do have an awful lot of health. Of course, after you enter the Mighty Mech, you also have to take your pilot out of your power armor, which you can put back in your supply, and then you place it inside of the Mighty Mech, attaching weapon pieces as required, and then you continue your turn as normal. The other thing to note about the Mighty Mech is that the power-up action has no effect while you are in it, and this means there's no way to heal while you're in the suit, and once you've entered it, you cannot voluntarily leave it. And those are all the actions. But remember, if you enter a space with an enemy, you immediately enter combat and do not get to perform your card's action. So next, let's learn how combat works. First of all, the player who moved into the zone initiating combat immediately earns one point, as you're reminded of here. Then they perform the first attack by resolving any one weapon currently attached to their figure. And these will have two lines, as we saw earlier, but you only get to use the top normal attack unless an ability or effect lets you resolve the power attack of the second line instead. For example, we saw earlier that if these two actions put you into combat, the first weapon you pick will get to use its power attack. But no matter which line you're resolving, your opponent reduces their health by the number shown at the start of that line. And then you resolve any special abilities in this area that might apply. During combat, you'll score one point for every point of damage you do to your opponent, and you're reminded of that right here as well. Just note, you ignore any points you would score for damage that you dealt after your opponent was reduced to zero health. So for example, if this opponent only had one health left and I dealt three points of damage, I would still only score one victory point. Now after using a weapon, you rotate it. This means it's exhausted and you will not be able to use it again during this combat. Assuming your opponent was not knocked out by your attack, then they will pick one of their weapons to use against you, and back and forth it will go like this with each player using one unexhausted weapon at a time. Now, when it is your turn to attack, you will want to pay special attention to what type of weapon your opponent just used. The type is shown here, and it will be either melee, area, or ranged. Using this chart here, if the weapon you pick next counters the weapon your opponent used, you will get to resolve the more powerful second line of that weapon. For example, if my opponent just used a melee weapon, I get to use the power line of any ranged weapon I then use. Then when my opponent goes, since I used a ranged weapon, if they use an area weapon, they use its second line, and so on. If it ever gets to your turn in combat and all of your equipped weapons are exhausted, you cannot attack and you must retreat. This will end the fight, and your opponent gets one point for this, as shown here, and then you move your figure to the closest non-hostile orthogonal space, which is one either up, down, left, or right. A hostile space is one that contains any of your opponent's pieces. And if you have several valid options that are equally close, you can decide where you want to retreat to. Now, the other way that combat can end is if one of the players gets reduced to zero health, knocking them out. The player who knocked them out then scores one point. If you're knocked out while your pilot card is face up, restore yourself to full health and then place your figure on your home base. If an enemy is there, then place yourself in the closest space that isn't hostile. Also, if either your energy or credits are less than two, bump them up to two. If you're knocked out while in your power armor, return the armor to your supply and place your figure into the closest orthogonal space that isn't hostile. You'll also flip your sheet over to the pilot side and restore yourself to full health. You should also adjust your weapons as necessary, ensuring that you only have basic ones equipped and attach them to your figure. Finally, if you're in the mighty mech suit and you get knocked out, remove your pilot from the suit and the player who knocked you out can choose to immediately jump into it, even if they aren't wearing power armor or at full health. Then they adjust their player cards and weapons, picking either side of the mech to use, and then they would gain two points as usual for jumping into the suit, while the knocked player moves their pilot to the closest orthogonal space that isn't hostile. Either way, after a fight, all players unexhaust all of their weapons, rotating them upright again. Sometimes when you enter a space with an enemy, you'll find an opponent's mine or turret there as well, and as you're shown here, a mine always resolves first and then combat starts, whereas a turret 
always resolves after the fight, assuming its target has been knocked out or forced to retreat. With that understood, it's now time to talk about something else that happens when a player is either forced to retreat or is knocked out. At that exact moment, they enter what is known as ad hoc mode. Here, you pick up and set aside all of your played and unplayed program cards, replacing them with your ad hoc program. For the rest of your remaining turns this round, you will now freely choose any one of the eight program cards to perform. It can even be ones that you played previously. When it's your turn again, you can then once more choose any one of the eight action cards. Basically, once you're in ad hoc mode, you have a lot of freedom. The only catch is that on your very first turn after going into ad hoc mode, you cannot perform an action that would cause you to start combat with another player, which you're reminded of here, though you should note that other players can still immediately start combat with you. Once everyone has resolved all four of their turns, the round ends and a new one begins, unless it's the end of rounds two, four, or six. As indicated by this symbol, before going to the next round, instead all players have a chance to score some victory points as shown here. For each zone you control with a mine, you will score that zone's value. So blue in this case would score two points. For each zone you control with a turret, you will score double the zone's value. So here blue would score four points. You also score the value of the zone that your pilot is in. So again, blue would get two points for this. And you will get those points even if you already scored points from that zone due to a mine or a turret. So in this case, the blue player would score four points for the turret and another two points for their pilot. And finally, if a player is in the mighty mech, they score three points. After any scoring, if necessary, when it's time to advance to a new round, move this token to the right and then pass the starting player token to the next player in clockwise order. Any players in ad hoc mode go back to normal and all players pick up their program cards to start making plans for the next round. The game ends after scoring the sixth round, and then each player adds to their score all of the points showing here on the weapons that they own, whether they're equipped or just in their stockpile. Then the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player who controls the mighty mech wins. If no one controls the mighty mech, the tied player with the most weapons wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. The game also comes with rules for playing solo, which are detailed here, and those I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Tiny Epic Max. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.